what you see here is part of a national phenomenon that we call high-tech wreck, a phenomenon that had to happen when the TV set married the computer. It starts with a quarter, and it ends up as a national industry estimated at seven and a half billion dollars a year. Video games, they seem to have captured America's imagination and its pocket change as well. Right now, the country's two hottest games are Chicago games. There's Defender, a space battle game made by Williams Electronics on the north side. The object is to fly over your planet, shooting down the enemy spacecraft, which are trying to capture your humanoids. Defender is prized for its nifty sound and visual effects. <laughs> In suburban Franklin Park, you'll find Midway Manufacturing feverishly turning out 350 Pac-Man games every day in three different cabinet styles. Pac-Man is known as the cute game. A voracious little yellow globe gobbles up golden dots and various kinds of fruit, all the while being pursued by four hungry monsters, which can themselves be eaten at crucial moments. Both Defender and Pac-Man are wildly successful, and their corporate marketing executives think they know why. But the video games are becoming more and more popular, and it's because today's generation grew up on television. They're diving at you, they're bombing you, and here you are, one guy fighting off the whole uh, universe of aliens, and, and you do get uh, a certain uh, amount of thrill and excitement and a feeling of, boy, when you, when you conquer this game, you, you really come away satisfied. We're only limited on video games by the video game designers' and engineers' imaginations. Anything they can come up with, we can put on that TV set. The big explosion in coin-operated video games began in 1979 with Space Invaders. It, like Pac-Man, was designed in Japan, where both games became national crazes. Williams Electronics projects $200 million in revenues this year. Midway expects to do at least that well. Both companies are riding the crest of the video wave that this year we'll see Americans drop 300 billion quarters into the machines. Well, what do you think about when you're alone? I think I want to get out of this rat hole. I want to get online. I need a computer. In addition to the ledger, Ripple utilizes a virtual currency referred to as XRP but in a very different way than most virtual currencies are being used today. As your previous hearings have noted, a majority of virtual currencies are marketed to consumers to be used as means of exchange and a store of value. This poses serious liquidity, volatility, and security risks for consumers. Within Ripple, XRP is used very differently as a security mechanism and as an optional bridge between currencies. Each financial institution that uses Ripple is required to hold a small reserve of XRPs to be used as a postage stamp on transactions. With each transaction, a portion of XRP is destroyed, typically equating to a tiny fraction of a cent. This imposes a small cost on transactions, yet makes it overwhelming, makes overwhelming the network with illicit traffic or a denial of service attack prohibitively expensive. In this way, XRP helps secure the network from attack and ensures its resiliency and reliability. The other use case for XRP is as an optional bridge between currencies. If a bank needs to make a payment for a customer to a recipient in another country, the bank may choose to use XRP as a low-cost, efficient bridge between the sending and receiving currencies. XRP lowers the reserve requirements for making cross-border payments. However, use of XRP as a bridge currency is entirely optional. A bank can freely choose to transact only in fiat currencies. In your investigations and ultimate regulations on virtual currencies, I strongly urge the committee to consider these alternative use cases for virtual currencies and related technology. As this sector continues to mature, I trust that there will be additional innovative use cases for these technologies, many of which offer benefits to payment systems. Regulations should account 
for the varying use cases to ensure Canadian banks and consumers can realize their benefits. In summary, Ripple's technology allows banks to provide customers faster, cheaper, and safer payments to countries it previously could not access. Ripple does so while fully complementing and supporting regulatory compliance. I need a Sinologic 16. Sogo 7 data gloves. A GPL stealth module. One Burdine intelligent translator. Thompson iPhones. But let's do, let's do a hypothetical. Uh, we asked you about XRP at the beginning. You said, you know, I don't, I don't define Ripple's success based on the price of XRP. Let's in say the that. Term. Okay. I said that in the short term. Let's in say the that. Short term. Okay. I said that in the short term. Look, there, to be very clear, Ripple owns 61.x percent of all XRP. That's what I was going to ask you about. I want a very successful XRP ecosystem. The way I measure the success of that ecosystem is around volume, velocity. <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the, the success of any asset is going to be dictated by its usage, by its demand. You know, I, my point was simply, I think my point earlier was, I don't think about this, and I try not to check the price of XRP you know, multiple times a day. Sure, I probably check it once a day, but look, it's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. What I care about is if we are delivering for our customers, there's going to be increasing opportunities to use things like XRapid to solve a multi-trillion dollar liquidity problem. That's an exciting thing to go out and solve, and frankly, for the employees at Ripple, I think there's a mission-driven we want to ha put our dent in the universe and really enable an internet of value to truly let value move the way information moves today. And that is possible, and it has a lot of effects that I think are hard to predict in the same way the internet of information in 1997, could we have predicted I could walk outside and get a car on demand or a, right. you know, anything on demand, <laughs> whatever it is. Do you think that XRP right now is behaving based on Ripple the business? Like, hypothetically, it should rise or fall based on as Ripple signs more banking partners. Well, but of course, but of course I, I mean, there's a market yeah, completely I mean, a separate of, of everything. There's yeah. a lot of speculation. I think, that as we've talked already, there's a lot of correct information, there's a lot of misinformation. I, I just, uh, you know, I try not to think about the price of XRP. I, I certainly don't comment on the press, price of XRP. I, I will again point out Ripple, the company, as an owner of 61% of the tokens today, is the most interested party in the success of the XRP ecosystem. And we will do things to invest in the success of the XRP ecosystem because that's in our best interest. Hi, and welcome to the IIF studio, where I'm joined today by Patrick Griffin, who is head of business development for Ripple Labs. Uh, so Patrick, I wanted to ask you, Ripple Labs, you've developed Ripple the technology. C can you explain to us what that is? Uh, sure, so the Ripple technology is an open source protocol that is designed to facilitate the settlement of currency payments uh, in actually any currency, or any asset class for that matter, in real time and at no cost. Uh, so as a protocol, this is just a little bit distinct from a payment system. Payment systems are very deliberate uh, in terms of what they do. A protocol is just simply a piece of software. Um, and in this case, this piece of software is designed to transfer assets, reconcile obligations, uh, and really it's, at the end of the day, just a ledger. But it's a ledger that operates in real time at no cost? Correct. So it, uh, it, what makes it real time, what makes it no cost, is that this is a ledger that is run by no central operator. Uh, it's run by computers all over the world. Servers, computers, financial institutions typically run them. Um, and as a consequence, there is no central entity that is responsible for maintaining the system. So there is no central point of weakness. But there's also no central point of control. That's correct. So what does that mean for the financial so, system? So what that means, and this is a great question, I mean, what that means is that while it is an open source technology, I think critically from, an, from a uh, financial services perspective, it is 
maybe better to think about it as open architecture. Mm -hmm. And what that means in the distinction is that you can, we, we expect financial institutions and um, payment networks, governments and regulators to design closed systems on top of the open protocol. So that's the distinction between a payment system and a protocol is that it, this is not designed to be an end-to-end -end catch all payment system with rule sets and payment standards and messaging. It's very, very simply a basic layer of a payment system, just the ledger and the settlement component. So on top of that, we can construct all sorts of different closed systems and construct payment systems on top of the protocol. And you're expecting people to do that? Who are you expecting to do that? We expect financial institutions to do that, um, particularly on the, whole, on the wholesale side. Uh, we look at this technology as having its most profound applications uh, for interbank settlement, um, clearinghouse settlement, uh, using the technology to facilitate transfer of assets between, frankly, just different asset custodians. Um, and so we really expect this to be something where um, legacy systems, legacy networks can migrate their existing infrastructure mm -hmm. and capabilities right on top of the protocol. Password enter. <laughs> Welcome to BRT Online. Global Net selected. What are you doing? Making a long distance phone call. Beijing Hotel. Beijing selected. Access denied. Access granted. Hotel Beijing selected. General account selected. So a lot of you may have heard about uh, Bitcoin. It's been in the news quite a bit uh, lately. Uh, Ripple is really a second generation of the Bitcoin concept. And uh, as many of you know, Bitcoin and Ripple are really two things. Uh, they are a new global currency, um, what we call a math-based currency. Um, but maybe even as uh, more importantly, they are uh, global free payments networks. And what we've tried to focus in uh, with Ripple is that second part. Uh, what we're trying to build is a global payment network that allows anyone, anywhere in the world, to send any currency basically for free uh, that is irreversible uh, is so that you can make payments much more efficient. So we look at the currency that we've created in Ripple really as more of an enabler of a new global payment system. Local net selected. Command terminated. Come on. All the way back to me. Copy world selected. Yeah, it's here. Fax buffer selected. Part of it's here in the buffer of their fax modem. The reality is all, all the blockchain does is it confirms transactions and it proves historical value and, and where value has been. Uh, so what Ripple is is a little bit different, similar concept, but the difference is that it is simply a ledger, mm -hmm. um, a, just a, a spreadsheet, a snapshot in time. To confirm uh, with Ripple, you do not need to confirm the entirety of the history of every transaction that ever was. That's the blockchain. With Ripple, you just need to look at the snapshot in time understand what the changes will be to that snapshot, and then build a new ledger, and then have everybody switch to that. So that's the distinction between uh, a ledger and a blockchain. A ledger is historical. Mm -hmm. A ledger is a snapshot in time. And certainly with Ripple, you can walk the ledger and go back in time to any point in uh, any past ledger. But to confirm a transaction, critically, you don't need to confirm every transaction that ever was, which ultimately enables faster reconciliation and faster settlement. Blockchain works on roughly 10 minute intervals, uh, I intervals which typically pay, play out over hour blocks of time. Uh, Ripple works in two to five second basis. Mm -hmm. So this is something that operates in seconds as opposed to minutes or hours. Access denied. 
Come on, let me in! Get off my board. You are too hot. You're a hit. Waiting to have Ah, you owe me, Strike. I don't owe you that much. I could crash you from here, man. Wipe out your entire fucking board. Johnny, don't, man. That's my life, Leo. Stop bullshitting me! I need to know what I'm holding, Strike. Why is the Yakuza after it? Who's Dr. Alco? All I know is you got a head full of Pharmacon data. And they've hired the Yakuza to get it out. Pharmacon? Shit! They put a virus on it. So the transfer of assets with Ripple may be more uh, suitable for payment transfers with blockchain. Are you, do you think it's for different types of assets? Well, I think that this is one of the, the, the other distinctions between the two designs. Blockchain technologies are single purpose databases. They can only confirm transactions in one asset class or one denomination. Ripple is a general purpose database. It's just simply a spreadsheet. Anything can go in it, and we can denominate it in just about anything. So airline miles, loyalty points, you know, G10 currencies, gold, stock certificates, options, derivatives, anything of value can go inside of the Ripple ledger, which is very different than the way the blockchain technologies um, are designed and what they really, frankly, can enable. Lethal neural feedback now in effect.